Hey everyone, thanks for being here today. I'm Tate Campbell. I'm a data scientist at Change Healthcare. And today I want to share with you some of the work our AI team has been doing recently. So I'll tell you a little bit about who Change Healthcare is and what we do. And then I'll get into some of the specific problems we're trying to solve in healthcare and some of the tools and technologies like H2O that we're using to do that. First, I'll tell you a little bit about Change Healthcare. So first and foremost, we're a healthcare technology company. We're about 15,000 employees nationwide, so we're a pretty large company. And we have an extensive network of, of healthcare services uh, throughout the healthcare industry. And I'll get into that more in the next slide, but uh, it's, it's this healthcare network and the data and connectivity that come along with it that really serve as the foundation for our AI and machine learning projects. Just to give you an idea of some of the numbers uh, in, in terms of how big we are in scale, um, so in a given year we have nearly 14 billion uh, healthcare transactions flowing through our networks and that totals uh, around two trillion dollars worth of healthcare claims. So massive amount of money and data being exchanged through this network. We work with over 800,000 doctors, over 100,000 dentists, and uh, at, uh, we have uh, essentially one in five US patient records will come through our, our uh, network at some point in time. So we have a pretty sizable market share. Um, and, and like I said, this is really the foundation for our AI projects. We're trying to enhance, optimize, improve this, this network. Just to give you some stats as to uh, the, the size of the opportunity that is present uh, in, in, health, uh, in AI within healthcare. So healthcare is the number one US industry by revenue. It's the number two by R&D budget, and of course the number one and most important industry for saving lives. The healthcare industry also accounts for um, the largest number of AI opportunities and largest number of uh, AI startups at this point in time. So this is really a booming space, and we're, we're trying to establish ourselves as one of the leaders in this space. Uh, to tell you a little bit more about our AI team, which is the team I work on, we're a team of about 50 data scientists and data engineers. We work in Emeryville, California. This is a picture of our office building. You may have seen it as you're getting off the Bay Bridge. We're right outside of Oakland. And really, the, the goal of our team, we're focused on building out scalable machine learning solutions in the cloud. So we really take a firm uh, cloud-first architecture approach. Everything we do from initial model development, EDA, to productionizing models all takes place in the cloud. Next, I want to get into some of our use cases and some of the problems we're solving. So just to go back to this graphic uh, to tell you a little bit about, more about our business operations, you can see here in the middle of this graphic is Change Healthcare interacting with hospitals, insurance companies, and patients. And a lot of what we do involves facilitating transactions between those parties. And um, a lot of the problems we, we find, uh, they, they manifest themselves in, in the form of uh, insurance claim audits. So often these uh, insurance claims, uh, patients are being billed for charges, and these claims often go back and forth with each uh, party sort of arguing who uh, is responsible to pay what charges and, and so on. So, Oftentimes, we're interested in, in verifying the validity of the information in these claims. So um, what that looks like in a machine learning setting is essentially a lot of classification tasks. We may want to do things like uh, determine whether a certain diagnosis code was coded correctly or whether a, a uh, hospital charge was billed correctly and so on. Um, and so this is, this is kind of one of our, our core problems that we're trying to solve. And it's a, it's a problem that has uh, several layers of complexity and one that we approach from many different angles. The first one I want to tell you about is, is a, a version of this problem that we, we tackled with driverless AI. Um, so this is a screenshot from a, a model that one of my colleagues built. And what we were trying to do here was uh, essentially there, there's a form of this sort of insurance claim audit pro, uh, process where we have limited information. Um, so at the, the simplest version of that is we've already extracted a lot of relevant information from the claim. So these claims can come in in all kinds of formats like PDFs or raw EDI format. You've ever been exposed to that. So there's a lot of parsing that happens up front. And so this is a version of this problem where we've already parsed out a lot of the relevant information. And there's a lot of legwork that goes into that, and we have a whole business unit devoted to that. But essentially what we were doing here was we were working with this business unit, and 
they came to us and they, they were essentially, they're interested in predicting the, the likelihood of a successful appeal. So when they see an insurance claim come through, they're basically going to make their own determination on what they think the insurance company should have paid out for that claim. And when their assessment is much different than what the, the, the actions of the insurance company, they'll, they'll pursue that claim and appeal it and essentially ask for more money. Um, so, so this was a, a problem where um, sometimes we, we have very little information to go on here, and we're trying to make an assessment of whether or not we should appeal these claims with, with very limited information. And so our, our business unit has, uh, has, has struggled doing this in the past, and they came to us and asked if we could do this. So my colleague built this driverless AI model here, and, and what she found was that we were actually able to do this on, uh, on a specific subset of, of cases. And so um, unsurprisingly, the variance of these predictions was quite a bit larger than the business was used to dealing with, but um, we did find that we could actually do this, predict the likelihood of appeal with, with very limited information, much better than we traditionally thought. And just to kind of expand on this, uh, this claim auditing issue in, in a more general sense, as I mentioned, there's, there's multiple layers of complexity and different angles. Where that version, the one I just described, was a, a more simple version where we extracted a lot of the relevant information already, a more complex uh, version of the problem would be one where we're getting uh, raw data, such as a PDF, of someone's medical record. And this can be something like uh, verifying a diagnosis code was coded correctly and so on. And so we have, uh, this is a, a general schematic for our workflow for how we're dealing with this stuff. So, in general, we get these massive uh, PDF documents, 400-page medical records and insurance claims and things like that. And this is kind of our process for ultimately doing machine learning on these documents. So we start off as a PDF, and we do OCR on those PDFs via the Google Vision API. So we'll send those PDFs off to the Google Cloud, and what we get back is a JSON. So we essentially convert the PDF into a JSON of text, and from there, uh, we apply a series of regular expressions, and this is uh, kind of our, our custom in-house solution where we work with our subject matter experts and we, we devise a series of these robust regex um, and we, uh, we pull out windows of text that we think could potentially be relevant to uh, the machine learning problem at hand. So if, if it comes in as a 400-page document, we want to cut that down quite a bit. Um, so, for example, if we're looking for a certain diagnosis code or something like that, we may pull out the diagnosis code and three or four words on either side of that code. So we're pulling out windows of, of uh, what we deem to be relevant text, and then from there, those windows of, of text ultimately get featureized and get fed into a, a H2O model. And this is a general workflow that's worked really well for us, and it's, it's been really amazing what we've been able to do with this. Um, so next what I want to talk about is, is kind of an, an offshoot from this line of work. And uh, one of the biggest problems we've had with this workflow is just getting labeled data. Um, so in order to build a supervised machine learning model to do something like this, you essentially have to have a bunch of these medical records labeled, right? So you have to, you have, to have a set of medical records where you know they were coded correctly and a set where they were coded incorrectly. And those are hard to come by. I mean, often the only way to really get that is to have someone read through these documents and basically make their own assessment on whether it was done correctly or not. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've devised our, our uh, a custom active learning solution uh, in-house, and, and uh, the goal of this is really twofold the, at the active learning we're doing. One, as I mentioned, is just to get more labeled data. So this is a way for us to get uh, more labeled medical records and, and uh, insurance claims and whatever it is we're trying to, to classify. And uh, the second goal of this is really to perform these feature engineering experiments. So as I mentioned, we run these regular expressions that we, uh, we think will pull out relevant text. And sometimes we come up with a new one and you know, maybe a, a subject matter expert says, hey, maybe this, uh, you know, if this phrase occurs in the medical record, that might be relevant. And so we want to test that out. So ultimately, we want to perform these feature engineering experiments where uh, we're, we're pulling out windows of text, featureizing them, and ultimately seeing whether the models are able to pick up on, on signal from that. So I don't have time to go through this whole diagram, but this is uh, essentially a, a workflow for, uh, for active learning as, as we do it. And, and what we've done here is uh, we've simplified this whole process and we've inserted H2O right at the core, and this allows us to do a number of things. 
For one, we can rapidly uh, explore models and iterate on models using things like uh, H2O flow UI, AutoML, driverless grid searching. Uh, H2O just makes it so easy to really rapidly iterate on 10, 20, hundreds of models and, and quickly see how the, the different types of models are able to pick up on uh, the signal that we're feeding. Another thing H2O enables to, us to do in this workflow is to quickly uh, examine feature importances and model results. So for those of you that have used H2O flow, you know how easy it is to pull up something like an, an ROC curve for a binary classifier and uh, variable importances. And, and this is something you, you can see here. So it's, uh, it, it makes our, our job much easier. Next, you can, you can quickly score the data in a flow notebook, right? So if you've got kind of a, a POC model and, and you want to make some predictions and um, kind of go one step further than the cross-validation, we can do that. Uh, we can easily deploy these models as, as artifacts uh, when we're satisfied with the performance. So, you know, H2O makes it extremely easy to uh, have a working model, quickly deploy that as, as a, an artifact, a mojo or pojo or whatever, and, and quickly deploy that into a production model. And then lastly, this is something we're working on. Uh, this is a, a, a proof of concept, but we're, we're envisioning a, a scenario where all of this is happening autonomously. So this whole process, the, the labeling, the feature engineering experiments, and the feedback loop is all kind of happening um, behind the scenes autonomously, on, autonomously. So that's something we're working towards now, and, and we're really excited about it. Next, just to get into some of the tools and technologies we're, we're using for the most part. So uh, we're real big on Spark, uh, and that's one of the reasons we love H2O so much, is it works so well with Spark, um, sparkling water. Python is our, our primary language, although we do have some people using Scala as well. We use GitLab for our version control. We use AWS as our primary cloud platform, although we do use Google Cloud as well for things like the Vision API. We do most of our deep learning work in TensorFlow, and then lately we've been using Airflow as a, as a scheduler tool. So, and many more, of course, these are just some of the main tools we're using. This is a, uh, a brief schematic that kind of shows how uh, we're deploying some of these jobs. So this is kind of a general batch scoring framework uh, that we're currently doing. So in general, how, how these projects get deployed are you know, we work with the team within the company. We identify a, a, a process where we can kind of drop in a machine learning model and provide um, some lift there or some uh, efficiency gain. And so when we deploy our model, how that works, we work with our, our team within our organization and we set up a specific S3 bucket in our data lake. And so what happens, say we want to run this model every week or every day, uh, what, what happens is uh, every so often there's a regular cadence and our, our partners would then drop in a data file, be it a CSV file or JSON or whatever. And our Airflow scheduler is essentially listening to this S3 bucket. Once the data file comes in from our partners, what we do is we launch a CloudFormation stack, which is essentially just a way to launch a bunch of AWS services at once. Uh, I won't go into that too much, but the most important part here is we launched uh, an EMR cluster. And on that EMR cluster, we run our our uh, machine learning application, usually a PySpark application with H2O or uh, a, a, a pure Python with a, a TensorFlow model. From there, we're gonna re uh, read in the partner's data, score their data, and then ultimately we'll ship those model results, the output, back to the S3 bucket, so there'll be an inbound and an outbound location, and from there, our partner team will come and pick up the model results, integrate it into their workflow, and then that's how the, the models actually drive the business. This is uh, just to get into the airflow side of things a little more. This is an example of an airflow DAG, a directed acyclic graph. So uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but the, the thing to focus on here is just this middle pathway, which is what happens when we actually score data here. So you, you can see just uh, this is the same process I just described. Essentially, our partners send us data in a, in a batch scoring regime, and we want to score it. So what happens is the data comes in. Uh, we uh, spin up an EMR cluster, so we just spin that up on demand. So we, uh, it's a very cost-effective way to run things. We're not running these clusters all the time. We spin up an EMR cluster. We run a bunch of jobs. So here, these are a bunch of H2O models. It's eligibility one, two, and responsiveness. I won't explain it too much. Essentially, this is a project where uh, we're predicting Medicaid eligibility of members. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, we, we kick off the EMR. We run the modeling jobs. Here we have a, this decider step essentially collates the, the job from multiple models. So we have three, four models running here. And we want to bring those uh, together, those results, before we ship them off to the business. And then after all that's said and done, we've ran the modeling. We're going to tear the EMR cluster down. 
and uh, ultimately we'll, we'll ship those results back to our data lake and uh, inform the relevant parties that the job is a success. So that's kind of our general uh, workflow in, in, Air, in Airflow. Lastly, I just want to uh, make a note on compliance. So being a healthcare company, we, we have very tight regulations on what we can and can't do with our data. Um, so HIPAA is essentially the legislation that governs uh, data privacy uh, related to healthcare data. Uh, PHI stands for Protected Health Information, and it's, it's, it's very tough doing machine learning with, uh, with healthcare data when, when you have uh, sensitive data like that. So um, there's a number of things we do to uh, combat this. One is, uh, as I mentioned, we have a data lake, and we're entirely cloud-first architecture. So everything we do from initial model deployment, or initial model exploration, EDA, uh, all the way up to production deployment, all takes place in the cloud. So we're not pulling data down to our local machines or anything like that. It all stays in AWS, and so that's one measure of security. And then H2O has always been really great on working with us on this uh, front as well. Um, they've, right from the start, they've been one of the few machine learning companies that have really acknowledged our, our, um, our restrictions in terms of what we can and can't do with our data. They've worked with us to um, produce customized hardened H2O builds. So a lot of the security features that were implemented in H2O3 were uh, built directly for our company. And we, um, what we have is, is uh, called SSL internode security. Essentially that means that all the information flowing between, between the nodes of our EMR cluster is all encrypted and, and completely secure. So um, that's just another reason um, why working with H2O has been great for us. So hopefully you've, you've learned a little bit more about Change Healthcare, the sorts of problems we're, we're trying to solve and, and how we're solving them. And if you're interested to hear more, please come find me or my colleagues and we'd be happy to talk to you. And thanks for listening.